Welcome to lecture five uh, for anthropology. We'll be taking a look at prehistoric Egypt in this lecture, looking at the development of cultures in ancient Egypt before we get to the period where we start thinking of what is classically Egyptian with kings and uh, tombs. So we'll try to see what we can learn about these early Egyptian peoples and what they may have contributed to later Egyptian culture. I'm going to start first with some key ideas that we need to take into consideration about the evolution of, of human beings. Um, and in, in anthropology, this is the work of biological anthropologists. Um, they are focused on human remains and what we can learn from uh, bones and skeletons and teeth. They're focused on um, human evolution. So you can take entire classes on biological anthropology and look at the evolutionary record for the development of human beings. Um, the summary of what you would read right now is that our current best hypothesis is that human uh, beings evolved in Africa and then spread outwards from Africa. Um, there's a lot of different um, peoples and skeletons that we could look at, a lot of different evolutionary developments, but I'm just going to focus on two. Um, as human beings evolved in Africa and moved outwards, um, millions, uh, thousands of years ago, um, they did so um, in groups, in waves, and the probably the most important for us to uh, talk about would be uh, two million years ago, um, the development of Homo erectus, uh, a predecessor to us uh, as people today. Um, Homo erectus, we know, used tools. We know that they managed fire, um, that they hunted and gathered for their food. Um, and then there's some evidence of rudimentary art, some, um, some artistic representation or drawing, or maybe doodles. Uh, it depends on when you look at some of the stuff that's claimed to be artistic. Um, but they are clearly leaving a mark and changing, you know, the physical area around them, um, whatever they're trying to represent. Um, once this group um, evolved into Homo sapiens, that was about 350,000 years ago, we see people Homo erectus, as this reconstruction shows, begin to look more like modern, what we would think of as modern human beings. Here is a reconstruction of the oldest of the fo oldest fossil Homo sapiens we have uh, from a, um, Morocco. Um, and we can see the difference between this female Homo erectus here on the left and Homo sapiens on the right. And Homo sapiens emergence um, over time is linked to things that we think are quintessentially um, definers of who we are as people, language, art, religion, as well as the use of tools, fire, hunting, those sorts of things. So that is the background to um, the anthropological look at the origins of people. Let's now take a look more specifically at what we will be finding in ancient Egypt. Our timeline for ancient Egypt is going to be divided into two periods. Um, the first is called the Paleolithic which is just a fancy word for old stone. Three million years ago to 12,000 years ago. Notice I'm using YA years ago 
rather than BCE, because the further back you go, the easier it is to say how many years ago something happened, rather than giving a BCE date for it. Um, so Paleolithic peoples, old Stone Age peoples, do appear in ancient Egypt about 500,000 years ago. That's our earliest evidence that we've got. It's very likely um, there were people before then, but archaeology is dependent on what's left behind. And in Egypt, it's sometimes quite difficult to find things. Um, the Delta region, artifacts don't survive. Other regions um, where they could survive, um, it's you know, continually inhabited by people, so the record gets a little bit messy. We do know for the Paleolithic peoples that they used stone tools. Um, they were also hunters and gatherers. Toward the end of the Paleolithic, we see burials. Um, we see some evidence possibly of seasonal travel that is living in one place, moving to another place um, in order to keep up with food supplies. Um, the picture here on the right is uh, one of the earliest burials that we found, uh, Taramsa Hill. It's a child about the age of eight, um, and he's leaning backwards, so his head is resting, looking up to um, the sky, um, and then slightly tilted east. And the archaeologists who ex excavated this are pretty sure that this is a deliberate burial, not just an accidental, he fell in place like, oh, you know, in the spot. Um, so we do see burials in this time period, but they're nowhere near the complex burials we associate with ancient Egypt. Um, we're going to get there. It's coming. The next date in the calendar is the Neolithic or New Stone Age, um, roughly about uh, 11,000 years ago to 6,000 years ago. The Neolithic is going to have more settlements, actual villages. <clears throat> and these village sites uh, will see a really important development in human history, agriculture. Um, the actual deliberate um, growing of food products, uh, the manipulation of the environment, uh, uh, planting, those sorts of things. Uh, we do see domestication of animals in this time period, uh, the making of pottery. We find people building huts in order to live in uh, homes to protect themselves from the elements. Um, we do see graves with grave goods, but not everywhere. Not every site in ancient Egypt will have grave goods associated with burials. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of an excavation. Um, this is Merimde Beni uh, Salama in the Western Delta, about 4800 BCE. Or if you want to do the whole thousands of years ago thing, um, that would be 6,800 6, years ago. Um, and you can see from the picture here um, that this is a this is a fairly significantly sized area of people living in a settlement together, um, and that's going to be a hallmark of the Neolithic time period. Agriculture means that you need to settle down um, because you got to watch the plants and wait for them to you know do their thing, um, and then you know take care of them along the way. Um, and then, of course, settling down, waiting for the plants to grow, keeping cattle, for example, or other animals. So it's going to be a significant feature of Neolithic life in ancient Egypt. Um, and what I'll spend the rest of this PowerPoint doing is looking at some of these various cultures that appear um, in the Paleolithic and Neolithic. Um, Egyptologists describe these cultures largely by the name of the settlement where they're first archaeologically excavated. So you'll, you'll see a lot of names, a very dizzying array of names, based on some archaeologists excavating in a certain little area and going, I will name this the blah, 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 blue, blue people. 
um, over time, comparing a lot of these archaeological reports, we can make bigger and broader associations. But you do have to remember, Egypt is a big place. Um, and so Egypt won't have the same cultural developments um, in the Delta area towards, you know, the Mediterranean as it will in the South. So um, there will be kind of an array of things to keep up with. Let's try them out. Fascinating cultures, I think, in prehistoric Egypt is uh, the Nabta Playa culture, um, 7500 BCE or um, 9,500 years ago. Um, it's located close to Nubia, um, though that would have made any sense to the people living there because they didn't have the term on a map and nobody had a map to go, well, this is Egypt, this is Nubia. Um, but it'll at least give you a geographic kind of reference, and I'll show you a map in just a moment. Um, so you can see here Nabta Playa way down here in the south of Egypt far away from the Nile River. Um, so this is quite a fascinating um, culture group. We know that they're hunter-gatherer, just like their ancestors would have been. We think that they raised cattle, so there's evidence of domestication or, or pastoralism, the raising of um, animals fascinating in their use of stone to construct um, their settlements, uh, their building of deep wells. So this is something that seems like an advance um, over at least their ancestors. And of course, when you're this far out in the desert, you're going to need some water. Here's one thing I find really fascinating. Um, there may have been a religious cult attached to cows, um, we've seen some evidence of sacrifices uh, of cows buried in stone roof chambers that have been lined with clay. Um, and you might think, well, okay, whoop de doo what does this indicate besides just a rudimentary religion? Well, one of the major Egyptian deities, um, Hathor, is a cow goddess. And so cows are very important in the culture of ancient Egypt. And we see here, you know, 9,500 years ago, there's a group of people um, with a very strong particular religious connection to cows. But the coolest thing I think about the Nabta Playa is they may have had an astronomical calendar um, aligned to the stars. Um, and there's a picture, picture of it shown here reconstructed. Um, there's a lot of debate about what this really represents um, and how accurate the alignment is. But what I think we can walk away from with, at least based on the evidence, is that these people were paying attention to the heavens, paying attention to what's going on. I mean, what else are you going to do? You don't have Twitter and you don't have TV and don't have all the other fun stuff. So you have lots of nights to just look up into the sky and see what's happening with the stars. Um, and I think this is a really interesting feature because... Um, later Egyptians uh, will tie their calendrical system um, not just to the seasons related to the Nile flood, but also to the stars as well. And they're looking towards the heavens um, is an important part of their scientific knowledge. And here we see it um, 9,500 years ago. The next culture I want to talk about is the Marimda culture. Um, they are in the northern part of Egypt near the delta, on the western side of the delta. Um, so if you were to look on a map, go all the way up to the delta, and you can see here Marimda. Um, this is a group of people emerging 4800 uh, to 4300 BCE or um, about 6,800 or 6,800 years ago, um, 6,800 years ago. These folks are starting to look more like ancient Egyptians or the people we think of in ancient Egypt. 
Um, we find that their dead are buried in oval pits. But interestingly enough, within the settlement, so it's within where you live instead of like a separate cemetery outside. Um, what is also different from later Egypt is that um, we don't see evidence of grave goods or offerings to the graves. So it's burial, uh, but nothing really special about it that would look like later Egypt. Um, the people of this culture did produce weapons um, that are known as mace heads. Um, so it's essentially like a ball on a stick that you just whack people with. Um, and that does look like later Egyptian culture. Um, we'll see some example of, of mace heads from the first kings of Egypt. Um, my favorite thing about these people, even though it looks creepy as all get out, is a clay head that would be, had been broken into pieces. It's probably the earliest human representation of a, of a person in, in Egypt. Or it could have represented like a deity as well. Um, it's got holes all over it. We think perhaps uh, to include hair um, and maybe a beard. Um, there's definitely a hole in the bottom that um, had been placed there for the purposes of possibly putting on a staff and carrying it around. So possibly some kind of cult fi figure. So here's a mace head that I talked about. Um, these people are producing pottery, and here's the creepy little head. Oh my goodness, look at that. That is just freaky looking. But it does tell us something about these people culturally, that they are representing either humans or deities in a form that looks recognizably human. The last culture I want to talk about is Bidarian. Um, this is a culture emerging around 4400 BCE um, or you know 6400 years ago. Um, one of the things that I think is important to note about this culture is that this is very closely going to look like the earliest Egyptians uh, culture that we think of as being quintessentially Egypt. Um, the use of uh, black topped pottery that I'm going to show you pictures of, um, ornamental handles on pots. So this is not just a pot that I want to put grain in or cook in. This pot is artistic in a way. It's representing something more than just a functional use. Um, here, for example, is some Bedarian grave goods. Um, you can see the pot. We find also in their graves jewelry. So there's culture of personal adornment. You know, uh, you need to decorate yourself with jewelry. Uh, we find cosmetic tools. Egyptians do like their cosmetics. Um, so that indicates personal adornment as well. I am decorating myself uh, for some reason. We find figurines. Um, we find use of copper, copper pins, all kinds of things that are starting to look more like uh, what we think of the ancient Egyptians having um, culturally. Um, the dead were buried in oval pits, um, buried on the left side, facing to the west, but the head pointing south. Now, very clearly, a decisive um, set of rules here for how you deal with um, deceased people. Um, so the idea is we are developing a funeral culture. It's important that we bury our dead. We bury them with things, um, things that are important to them as people, and we bury them in a certain way um, um, because that all has meaning to us as a people. Uh, for example, facing west is uh, the, in later Egyptian culture, the west is the place of the dead. Um, so you go west to go to, to, uh, to death. Um, and if you think about it, the sun sets in the west. So it even mirrors nature in that regard.
We do see some evidence of class differences. So not everybody has the same amount of things in their grave goods. And clearly, if we were an equal society at this point, um, all the graves would look roughly alike. But there's difference in that some people have and other people don't have as much. So as Egyptian society is becoming more like what we think of uh, for ancient Egypt, we see um, class social differences starting to increase. Here is a female figurine, maybe a goddess figurine, um, um, found in archaeological excavations. Um, all kinds of images um, start to appear. Um, this is not an uncommon thing to find in the ancient world in general. Lots of figurines of women, uh, particularly the triangle here, suggestive of fertility, large breasts. Um, there's a lot of evidence in the ancient world early on for um, veneration, maybe worship, maybe a high regard for the fertility power of women. Um, and we see that um, in this culture. Okay, so I'm going to break away from Egyptian uh, prehistory for just a moment to talk about one of my favorite Egyptian archaeologists, an absolutely fascinating man who was incredibly brilliant, um, precocious child. That is William Matthew Flinders Petrie, pictured here. Quite a dashing figure he cut. Um, Petrie is really the first um, scientific archaeologist of ancient Egypt. Lots of early archaeology in Egypt was, I found a tomb, let's go loot it, woo! Ooh, they're mummies, let's see what we can find, um, jewelry-wise. The excitement of ancient Egyptian archaeology was to find really cool artifacts. And Petrie made a habit of studying the mundane, the ordinary, the, the stuff that everybody else said, ah, throw it away like pottery, for example. Um, pottery is all over ancient Egypt. You, you can't step anywhere without finding pots um, in the field. And Petrie was one of the first people to say, we need to pay attention to that and figure out what's going on here with pottery. Um, and one of the problems he ran into was dating prehistoric Egypt is not easy. Um, we don't have radiocarbon dating at the time he's working in the 19th century. And so he can't find text. These prehistoric people haven't written down a record of when they were doing what they were doing. So he tried to try to figure out a way that he could sequence or date these prehistoric developments. Um, and he figured pottery would be his key to doing so. So he took all the data that he had on pottery um, about what the kind of pot was, where it was found, um, you know, what the context was in the grave. He wrote all these uh, little pieces of slips of paper with all this data on it. And he invented something that is pretty brilliant. It's called seriation. Um, there's a whole lot of complicated mathematics behind it um, that uh, you can read about if you're interested and I'll point you in the right direction of how to do this. Uh, but essentially, by looking at the evolution of materials over time, you could see the changes in those materials um, and look at the way they appeared from the earliest things that you find to the later things that you find. And it won't create a perfect dating system, but it'll create a relative dating system um, that you can help you kind of sequence how um, these prehistoric cultures developed. So the humble pot in Petrie's case um, helped spur really scientific archeology span in ancient Egypt. Um, it's a, an amazing development, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but for the 19th century, this, this is a brilliant man.
Um, and here's just a chart of the prehistoric pottery that we see that Petrie put on the slips to figure out exactly um, how he would sequence them. So the different sizes, the different handles, wavy handles, um, comb designs, black and red pottery. And so by looking at the sequence of how these appeared and in what quantities they appeared and where, um, he helped make Egyptian archeology span for an era without words speak to us today. So that's been your introduction to prehistoric Egypt. See me next time for the earliest phases of what we think of as classically Egyptian culture.